Welcome back, crew. It's November, so that means we are diving into the wonderful Savage World system. Today, we're going to be going over the core mechanics of Swade. So by the end of it, you'll hopefully have a good idea of how to play the game and bring it back to you and your crew. So before we jump into that, though, I do want to give a shout out. We're going to be holding our actual play of the Savage World systems this Wednesday, November 30th at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. So if you're interested in kind of seeing how me and my crew go through the Suede system, jump in. It should be a blast. Uh, as I mentioned before, we're running a little bit of a jungle mercenary adventure using their modern system rules. So come hang out, see how we do with that. Uh, and then as always, with our Games of the Months, one of our big pieces, we want to get more people playing new systems. So if you drop by for the actual play on my channel, TeganJGaming at Twitch.com, uh, link down in the description, we'll be giving away a copy of the PDF to one lucky viewer. So we always wrap it off sometime during the game. So come hang out, see the system and play, and hopefully you'll be able to get to bring this back. But today, we're jumping into one of the biggest pieces of uh, playing any new system. We're going to be going over the core mechanics of the Suede system. So with that, we're going to show you how to roll the dice, how to run combat, uh, as well as just some of the other core features of the game. Now, Suede has a pretty in-depth rulebook, not like too crazy, it's not like Pathfinder or even 5e, but there's definitely some good bits to go with it. So this will be kind of a good overview, but there's definitely more depth beyond what we're going into, and if we do come back to the system, that could be definitely something we'll cover in the future. But, let's get into the, the, the first pieces. So, one of the core things for any TTRPG or picking up a new game is learning how to roll the dice. So Suede's pretty easy to roll, roll with this one. Typically, you're just going to need uh, between a D4 and a D12, uh, and that's what you're going to be rolling for pretty much your damage, your attribute rolls, uh, spirit rolls, all of that is going to be uh, done with between one of those dice based off of your attributes. Uh, and if you want to learn about the attributes, go check out our PC build video. We went into that a little bit more depth, uh, as well as skill selection. But today, we're just going to be going over kind of those base mechanics. So... Uh, with those attributes, you're going to usually have between a D4 and a D12. Uh, typically, uh, unless you're doing a contested role or in combat, uh, a 4 is your target number. So as long as you roll a 4, you'll most likely have a success with it. So you see all the kind of the spread of dice, D4, D6, D8, D12. Some of those have an easier chance to get to 12. Uh, D4, you've got to hit that 25% jackpot and make sure you get it. Uh, but with the D6, D8, D12, you have a little bit more leeway on the probability sides. So the more points you have at that attribute, or more uh, dice, I should say, you have at that attribute, the more likely you are to have a success. Now, one of the cool things with this system, uh, and one of my favorite pieces of it so far, uh, is the ace system, uh, as it's called in game, or exploding dice, as it's usually known around the tabletop field. Uh, what that means, so if you roll max value on the dice, so in that instance, if you got a D4 and you rolled a 4, you get to roll that D4 again. Uh, cool thing with that is if you get a 4 again, you get to keep rolling until you don't get a 4, adding all the numbers together. Uh, so it's just really one of those ones that can stack up and have some crazy scenarios. Uh, and especially, because one of the other core mechanics with the system uh, is the raise system. Uh, so as I mentioned, typically uh, your target number is going to be a 4. Uh, at every four you do better than that, uh, you get a raise, which either means uh, if you're doing uh, in combat, which will go into combat a little bit more depth, you can get some extra damage. Or if it's a regular attribute roll or outside of combat roll, uh, you get uh, bon benefits based off of the GM's discretion. And GM's give them some fun for that because it's always cool when you got to stack up those dice and get a really crazy result. Or even if you just have a high dice, a D12, uh, and uh, just knock that target number out of the park. So. Kind of a cool piece on that side. The other thing to keep in mind with this system, though, because you, you're, we've already talked about your attribute role, which would be tied to one of your skill or your skill roles or trait roles, which would be tied to one of your attributes or skills. Uh, but one of the big things with this system uh, is how you get the wild dice. And this applies to any player, but also any kind of uh, important hero heroic or villainous NPC. So it's not going to be some extra in the background. It's going to be somebody that's going to be important to the story, or at least important to the combat. Uh, they will get a, an extra D6 for any of their rolls as well. Uh, and basically what happens is when you roll, uh, when your attribute or skill rolls, uh, you're going to roll the wild dice, which is a D6 along with it. Now, this isn't additive. So uh, let's say you got on that scenario, you rolled a D two D6, one of them being your wild dice, one of them being your regular attribute dice. Uh, and you got a three on your attribute dice and a five on your wild dice. Uh, you could choose which of those to use. Uh, of course, you want to use the higher of the two. 
Uh, now, on the other hand, though, uh, the wild dice can um, explode as well or get the aces. Uh, so it's kind of a cool one on that side. So even if you're unskilled or uh, even if it's kind of one of your lower uh, attribute or trait rolls, uh, you get to add that wild dice uh, and hopefully uh, do a little bit better on that roll and get some benefits too. So I thought that was cool. And I like too that the, uh, the important NPCs get it too because it just kind of makes it fun. It gives some uh, cool pieces to the game. Uh, so that's kind of the core piece of the rolling of the dice. The only other thing I would mention is they do have crit fails in the system. Uh, that is if you roll a one on your wild dice and a one on your um, attribute dice, uh, that's a crit fail and whatever is going on is going to get far worse with those. Because uh, it's definitely a low likelihood of it happening, but when it happens, the GM is going to have some fun and uh, definitely bring some catastrophe with it. Uh, but that's just a little bit about the rolling the dice side. Uh, fairly fairly intuitive with it uh just always remember i think the biggest confusion i've seen come from it just reading about it is the wild dice and the regular dice just remember you don't add those together uh you always just take whichever total uh you prefer uh which so whichever one rolled better <laughs> uh so just remember that as you're going through i've seen uh, kind of the videos and even with my one shot on deadlands i played in as an earlier player um i got a little confused myself so just kind of make sure that when you're going through and rolling that you keep them separate and remember the total for each one uh, so that's a little bit about the dice rolls. Uh, one thing I did want to give a little bit more information on is the kind of the wild card system. So we've already mentioned that the wild cards who are either PCs or heroic or villainous NPCs, they get the D6. Uh, but what also everybody starts with, uh, so this is the PCs included, you start with three wounds. Uh, so you get to have those on that side. Uh, so basically we'll go into combat a little bit later but just remember with those wild cards you get the heroic dice the three wounds and they're only going to be used for people that are going to have an impact on the story or combat these wouldn't just be kind of a Joe Schmo sheriff this is somebody that's going to be definitely named definitely uh, going to be around for a bit or make a, a big shake hopefully before we dive into combat, the last thing I did want to touch on are bennies. Uh, and bennies are kind of like a form of inspiration with the game. Uh, so with that, uh, you're able to uh, get a couple of different benefits. And actually, we're going to jump into the book so you guys can see kind of all the cool things you get with the benny side. Uh, with that... Because the Benny is basically, uh, you start the game with one, uh, but usually the GM is kind of encouraged to give these out for good role play, good tactics. Uh, they even mention just making the table laugh in character. Uh, they, they, they mention that you're supposed to give these away pretty freely, uh, and they've got a number of cool uses you can do with them as well. Um, one of them, kind of standard re inspiration, you can re-roll one of your trait rolls. So if you wanted to re-roll your shot because you missed, roll that. Uh, you can recover from being shaken, uh, which is a combat condition, which we'll go into a little bit later. Uh, you can soak rolls, draw a new action card, which is how they do initiative in the system, uh, re-roll damage, regain power points, uh, and even influence the story, which is a cool one. Uh, basically, this is kind of a it's discretion. is up to the GM and how far you can push it. Uh, but you may be able to allow your characters to, to make some changes to the world uh, to benefit the story. So definitely a cool collaboration piece on that one. Uh, for anybody that's familiar with Mutants and Masterminds, kind of similar to the heroic points on that side where they can kind of change the scene a little bit. I like those because I feel like it gets a player buy-in, especially if you've got a good table of players that's not going to try to win the game with it, but just kind of add to the story. It just it makes it fun on that. So definitely with the bennies, uh, they recommend like having like if you're playing a po a person, they sell like different chips for bennies. Uh, but you even use like poker chips and things like that to uh, determine how many you have in there. And the virtual tabletops even too have some uh, kind of virtual bennies you can pass out to your players, so they've got a little stack of them and know how many they've got working with them. But overall, uh, like that system, I always love different ways you can reward your players for having good role play uh, and really buying into the game. And the bennies I think do a really good job with that. So now we touched on the bennies uh, and the how to roll the dice. We're going to jump into combat with the uh, suede system. So this one, uh, and I like this one so far. I, I played one shot with Deadlands, but it was a pretty quick one, so we didn't really get to go into this as in much depth. Uh, but from what I was reading, uh, this system has a pretty fleshed out combat system I can definitely have some fun with. Uh, now... One of the things I'll clarify right away, because this confused me, I had to Google it. Uh, and so uh, with this system, they don't use uh, kind of a, it's not like a 5e where you'll have like a five foot uh, kind of increments of five foot for the movement. Uh, they basically measure it in inches uh, and one square uh, equals an inch. 
did not realize that before. So like what battle map tactical square is an itch. I never knew the measurements for them. Uh, in the 10 or so years I've been playing TTRPGs, definitely a little bit of ignorance on my part. Uh, but also on that side, that one inch equals a square and one inch also in the in-game terms equals two yards and everything be measured in yards. So just got to keep that in mind as you're going through and building your, your characters uh, and ranges for your weapons and all that and kind of translating the, the map to fiction. Uh, one square, two yards, and you can even do bigger maps and have kind of like larger spaces between them and they've got rules for that as well. So... Just wanted to get that out of there. That was one thing that confused me. I had to do a bit of Googling, so wanted to share the wisdom, even though you may already be like, yeah, we knew this already. Uh, but now that we've got that out of the way, getting into how they handle combat. So one of the interesting things with the suede system, and I'm looking forward to, I don't know if we did this with the Deadlands one, uh, but I'm looking forward to seeing how it plays out, uh, is you get to draw initiative each round. And the way you, or you do initiative is you draw uh, action cards. Uh, so you go through and you have a deck of regular cards, uh, regular cards, except I should say there's two jokers included. Uh, and you go through and each round, uh, you draw or deal out cards to all of the players as well as the wild card NPCs. Uh, any of the ones that aren't wild cards are called extras, uh, and they will share either the player's initiative, if they're one of their companions or minions, uh, or just have a villainous extra roll, draw, uh, and they'll all go after that. But each round of combat, you'll draw a new card. Uh, and then basically, they're going to go through and determine who goes when, uh, with aces being high, uh, and then going down kings, jacks, queens, all of that, down the line uh, until two. Now, if you draw a joker, you get a couple cool things. So if you draw a joker as a player, all of the, the, the player crew, the party, uh, gets one Benny for free. Uh, and you also, as a joker, get to go wherever you want to. So you can go high if you want. If you want to do something right away, you can beat out the ace and go first. Uh, or if you want to be a little bit more strategic, you can just kind of pick where you want to go on that side. So I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, and now for my GMs, I know you're like, what if I draw the the joker? Uh, the GMs also get a bitty uh, for some of their wild card NPCs. So that's cool. And also, I should mention too for the Benny side uh, is the DM, uh, the game master, gets two biddies per player, uh, as well as their wild or one biddy per player, and their wild cards get two biddies apiece. So I like that too. It's fun. Usually, most systems don't give the GM uh, inspiration, so it's nice to have some fun things you can play with, uh, and make sure your villains actually look a little villainous and get some extra uh, chances in case your dice are going against you, which is always nice to have as a DM too. Because sometimes you make that really cool NPC or make a really cool moment uh, and your dice just fall flat and it just doesn't hit the same you want it to. Now you've got that Benny, you can throw it in there and make sure it sparks the way you want it to. So now that we've got that, we're gonna go a little bit into the actions of combat. So with uh, as a regular player, uh, you have three things you can pretty much do each turn. You can move, you can uh, take a regular action, and your action can be attacking, casting a power, supporting a player, uh, testing a foe. Uh, you can kind of do all of that. Uh, or, uh, or or you can just do kind of your regular shoot, hack, whatever. Also, on top of that, so you got the move, uh, your regular action, and then you have a free action they can do as well. So movement is going to be based off of your pace. So your pace for most PCs, unless you take an edge or have a racial feature, you're usually going to have a, a six to that, so a D6. Uh, so you'll be able to move six squares per round, which would be like, what, 12 yards, I think? Uh, quick math on that side. Uh, so keep that in mind. Uh, also with that, though, uh, as a free action, once per turn, if you wanted to uh, like dash in 5e terms, you can run in sway terms. Uh, this time you would roll the D6 and add it to your pace, but any of your actions would suffer a minus two per the turn. So, and definitely, I think that as they don't say this, but as a game master, I would say you should declare that at the top of the round uh, and not try to cheese it and run at the end. So with that, so you've got your attack, you've got your multiple actions. Uh, there's also multiple actions you can take, which we'll go probably into another video of that side. I know this would get a little long, but there's multiple actions. There's rules for kind of determining that piece out. Definitely check into the book on that side. Uh, or stay tuned for another video, because uh, that's definitely something I'd like to cover with more time. But the big thing I wanted to get into today uh, is how the attacks work and how damage works in the system, because I think it's a really cool system. So with this, uh, and attacking, as we mentioned, there's two different ways you can attack, typically. Uh, you've got powers in there, which we're not going to cover today, uh, but the main ones are going to be either a melee attack or a ranged attack. Melee uh, is going to use the fighting skill. 
Uh, so you'd roll whatever your fighting skill is. So if you've got like uh, with our PC we built last time, he had a D8 in fighting. So he'd roll that D8 plus his uh, uh, wild dice uh, and he'd be shooting to beat the person's parry score. So your target number for this isn't going to be four. It's going to be whatever that person's parry score is, which is half their fighting dice plus two. So that's one that you have to kind of work with the DM on that side, see what it is, uh, and then figure it out. Also, with uh, melee weapons, uh, when you get to the damage portion, uh, you roll the weapon's damage dice, but you also get to add strength to it. So they can do a little bit, a little bit of good damage on that too. So just kind of keep that in mind as you're working with the melee weapons. Uh, now when it gets to the range side, uh, you are going to have a target number of four again for this, but there's range penalties. So the target number of four starts at short range, uh, but the further out they get, rather than changing the target number, what they do is add a negative modifier to it. Uh, so if you're at medium range, it's minus two, long range, minus four. Uh, you just have to keep that in mind as you're rolling those dice. And the, the ranges are going to be determined uh, by your weapon. So if you had a weapon that was uh, 20, uh, 20 yards on that side, which would be four squares. Four squares? Not four squares. Uh, that'd be 10 squares, sorry. Two yards per square. <laughs> uh, so that'd be 10 squares. If it's beyond 10 squares, you'd be in medium range, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so it's kind of cool that side, just to keep that in mind. And I always like when they apply some real world logic to it, because the further you are from somebody, the harder it is to be able to shoot, uh, especially depending on the weapon type. So I think that kind of balances it out a little bit there. Uh, you also get to determine, uh, kind of keep in mind as you're shooting, the rate of fire. Uh, so if you're shooting like a machine gun or, uh, or even if you're shooting like a, a pump action shotgun, uh, you have to look at whatever the rate of fire is for that weapon. Uh, so if you've got a rate of fire of one, uh, you've got one bullet uh, to get to determine where that's going. Uh, but if you've got two or three or however many it goes up to, you can kind of go through and choose where those bullets are going. But you still kind of roll everything all at once. You have to, uh, so if you've got a, a gun that does, let's say, two rate of fire. Uh, and like, let's say for our guy that we built, uh, sar the sergeant, uh, he had a D10 in shooting. Uh, you'd roll two D10 uh, plus your D wild dice. Uh, and the wild dice, you still just roll that once. And then you get to determine where those shots are going. Uh, and then if those shots hit. So if you roll two D10, you get a one and a four. One of those shots would hit. You decide where it's going. Uh, and you call, you call that out before, I should say, too, kind of who you're shooting at. Uh, and then um, you apply the damage of the weapon. And for ranged weapons, that's a fixed damage. You don't add any additional modifier to it. Uh, you'd roll uh, whatever it says for the rate damage for the weapon. So pretty easy on that side to follow. Biggest thing for the range side is uh, taking a note of uh, where you are uh, in regards to the, the distance. Because you got to make sure you're applying those modifiers uh, and getting those calculated in right. So last thing we're going to touch on today uh, is damage because that's a pretty cool system the way they have it set up. So I want to make sure that we go over that. So, you know, what happens if you take a hit and how that affects and how that plays out down the line, too. So with the damage system, uh, so if you get hit with a uh, let's say somebody shoots you with a, a gun uh, and then say they rolled 2d6. Uh, you have to, uh, when the die comes out, the biggest thing you will determine if you take damage uh, is that the weapon is less than your toughness effect. And remember with toughness, you add an armor as well. So if it's less than that toughness, you're shaken, you're battered, but you're okay. There's no game effects. Now the issue comes in if it's equal to or more than your toughness. That, uh, when that happens, uh, you're going to be shaken. Uh, don't necessarily get a wound right away. Uh, but, uh, oh, sorry, actually, you do get a wound right away, uh, but if you are shaken uh, with that, uh, and let's say they rolled, uh, so let's say the first one they rolled, uh, and it was just kind of uh, you're, you're at your toughness, but if they got a raise to it, you take uh, another wound uh, and shaken. Uh, oh, sorry, actually, I mixed that up. So uh, if you uh, just get a raise without any raise and you weren't shaken before, you don't take a wound. If you were shaken before, you do take a wound with that first run. Uh, if they raise it, you get more wounds. If you were shaken before, you get uh, one wound and remain shaken. If you weren't shaken before, you get that first wound. Uh, so they've got a cool table. Take a look at it over there on that side. I got myself a little confused there. Uh, but uh, you kind of follow that along that side. And as I remember, P each PC has three wounds. Uh, and that kind of goes through. And uh, you kind of minus those wounds out from those three. And each time you take a wound, uh, you get a minus one to both your trait rolls as well as your pace. 
And that stacks up uh, until you get to three wounds and it's uh, minus three to all of those. Nice thing with this is you can get to three wounds and still be operating, uh, depending on if you're shaking or not. Uh, but once you get to three wounds and you take more damage that would cause a wound, uh, you are incapacitated. But before we go into capacitate, I want to touch on what shaken does to you a little bit. Uh, if you are shaken, uh, you can only take free actions. So that means you can move, uh, kind of do some of the, the small things that a free action will allow you. Uh, but you can't take a regular action and you can't take major moves. Uh, now, with shaken at the end of your turns, you can make a spirit roll. Out of four, uh, you get to uh, kind of unshake yourself and get back into the, the, the fray. Uh, if you fail, though, you just continue to be shaken. So uh, nothing too crazy on that one. Uh, but what does come in is incapacitation. Because incapacitation can be a little nasty. Uh, so incapacitation is when you're out of wounds. That's when you are knocked out. Uh, at the end of your turns, uh, you're still going to keep drawing action cards each turn, even though you're out of the fight, because you're going to be rolling to determine uh, if, you're, if it gets worse or if you get better. Uh, so you're going to roll vigor. On a critical failure, if you are uh, incapacitated, your PC just straight dies. Save for any wild card NPCs. Now, on a failure, though, uh, you're going to roll on the injury table. Uh, and you're going to take uh, one of those injuries, but the injury will be permanent for your PC. Uh, it's not going to go away. Uh, and your PC is also bleeding out. Uh, now, on a success with that one, you're going to roll the injury table. But your wounds will go away. Uh, your uh, injury will go away once your wounds are completely healed. On a critical success, uh, kind of similar, you'll either have uh, the best of 24 hours or once your wounds are completely healed. So pretty cool on that side. They got some good teeth to be incapacitated. I always like when PCs get injuries, kind of based off the story. So I think that'll be fun to see played out. Uh, and then also with that though, you're probably wondering how do I get rid of wounds? There's a lot of like healing skills and powers in the game. Uh, but if you don't have any of those, uh, every five days, the wounded PC will get to make a vigor roll. On a critical failure, they're going to increase their wounds. Uh, on a success, uh, they will recover one wound. Uh, so definitely uh, kind of goes through on that side. Uh, it just can definitely have some teeth to it. So you want to be aware of that. Uh, on a failure though, just on a regular failure, I should say, nothing happens. Keeps it easy there. So that was a real quick overview of the combat and dice rolling system for Savage Worlds. There's a lot of rules and intricacies we didn't cover within there uh, because it's a pretty robust system, which is nice. Uh, so stay tuned. We'll probably do some more videos for the system, uh, but definitely dive into that. Uh, there's some cool stuff you could do with this. I'm very versatile across like uh, different ages and like if you wanted to do like because with the system you could run like a modern age game like we're doing you do a sci-fi game uh you could even do a prehistoric game so it's a lot of cool things and intricacies that go along with those different ages but i wanted to just give a good overview of how the system works today so you kind of know hey this is what i need to know to run the game at the base level and they kind of learn as you play which i think is the the best way to pick up a new system but last shout out before we go Make sure to join us November 30th, this Wednesday at 7 p.m. Eastern Time on my channel, Tegan J Gaming. Link in the description for our actual play of the Savage World Systems. We're going to be diving into it. We've got a fun crew for this one. It should be a really good adventure, too. I'm looking forward to seeing some of their uh, kind of action movie hijinks and RP. Uh, but also, you will get a chance to win a copy of the Savage World Systems. So make sure you come through for that alone. Also, if you're new to the channel, drop a like, drop a subscribe. Each month we do this with a new RPG and go over how to build a PC, go over the core mechanics and just our impressions of the system. So enjoy the ride with us and get to learn about the wider world of TTRPGs. But overall, thanks for joining us and until next time.